Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Mears, the interim CEO and president of NCA, and I thank you for being with us. Brother Guy Cosomagno is a member of the Society of Jesus. He is a research astronomer, director of the Vatican Observatory, president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, and curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection. Brother Guy is known as the Pope's astronomer. Brother Guy believes in the need for science and religion to work in harmony rather than as competing ideologies. A graduate of MIT and the University of Arizona, whose women's basketball team did really well in the tournament this week, Brother is the author of several books, including Brother Astronomer, Adventures of a Vatican Scientist. He also co-authored Turn Left at, or at Orion and Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? Please join me in welcoming Brother Guy to NCA 2021. Thank you, Brother, for being here. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm assuming you can hear me? Yes. I've got a, a, little ta a little slide here. Let's bring that up and uh, see how this is all going to work. Um, share that slide. There we go. Right, so I'm Brother Guy Consolmagno, as you've heard, a Jesuit brother at the Vatican Observatory, actually the director of the Vatican Observatory. What I want to talk about today is both based on the astronomer part and the Jesuit part, because I want to talk about astronomy and Jesuit spirituality and the perspective they give to Catholic education. And what I'm going to talk about is based on my experience, both as a product of Catholic schools and as someone who has taught on occasion, both at the high school level, at the university levels, from rural schools in Kenya during my Peace Corps days to graduate students at Harvard and MIT. But mostly, I'm going to be using examples from my own life as a Jesuit astronomer and my experience as somebody who is a product, you know, a consumer of Catholic education. That said, don't be so impressed by the expertise in the cosmos. Um, as Chesterton once said, the earth is so very large and the cosmos so very small. The cosmos is about the smallest hole that a man can hide his head in. Okay, so Chesterton is a master of the paradox and this is an example of that. So what does he really mean? Think about it. The earth is so very large, the cosmos so very small and keep that in the back of your head. Meanwhile, let us go, you and I. The heart of Jesuit spirituality is found in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. If you've ever had a retreat from a Jesuit, you're probably familiar with the basic technique. The full exercises take four weeks. Now, if you've got only one week for a retreat, you shrink each week down to a couple of days. The first week is this week of preparation. And then at the beginning of the second week, you're invited to picture some scene in your mind, often a scene from scripture, and you imagine yourself participating in that scene. And at the very beginning of that exercise, you start by imagining you're with the Trinity, looking down and experiencing the whole of the human race from their perspective. The three divine persons looking at the plane of the world, full of men determining in their eternity that the second person shall become man to save the human race. So you're asked to see the place, the great capacity in the circuit of the world. And that's where I see myself looking at the space shuttle, looking at the world like you can see from the space shuttle. And that thin line, that thin blue line there, that's the band of life. That's the atmosphere of the earth. That's the stuff that we're busy poisoning right now. And that's perspective that Pope Francis was thinking of when he wrote Laudato Si. And I'm going to spend a few minutes here talking about Laudato Si, because I think it's one way to see how Jesuit spirituality works in practice. I hope you're familiar with it. It's short, it's simple, it's infused with Jesuit spirituality. But to really give you the basis, I'm not going to talk about this Laudato Si. I'm going to go back to the original one, the one that inspired him, written not by a Jesuit, but by St. Francis. And at first, you might think it's very different from how a Jesuit would experience the world. Laudato Si is the medieval Italian for be praised. So I'm using an English translation here, obviously. 
And it starts, be praised, my Lord, through all your creatures, especially my Lord, brother, son, who brings the day. And you give light through him. And he is beautiful and radiant in his splendor of you most high. He bears the likeness. And what we see here is the sun setting from the surface of Mars, as seen by the Mars uh, rover spirit. Be praised, my Lord, through sister moon. And you say, well, isn't that the sun that's during an eclipse? The black thing in the center there, that actually is the moon. And if you look carefully, you can see details of the lunar surface as illuminated by the light that went past the moon, hit the earth, bounced back, hit the moon again on the side we can see, and then bounced into our eyes. It's called earth shine. And the stars and the heavens, you've made them bright, precious, and beautiful. And this is an image of the globular cluster of stars, a cluster of ancient stars called M13. It's among the oldest clusters in our galaxy. The image came from our telescope here in Arizona, the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. Be praised, my Lord, through brother fire, through whom you brighten the night. He's beautiful and cheerful and powerful and strong. This is a close-up of a solar flare. It was imaged by the Swedish Solar Telescope in La Palma in the Canary Islands. As it happens, it was a Jesuit priest, Father Juan Casanovas, who helped establish the first solar observatory there back in the 60s. He later came to work at the Vatican Observatory, which is where I got to know him. And, and I remember a time one Sunday, after a full Sunday dinner and a few glasses of wine, when he started talking about growing up in Catalonia, in Spain. He was a kid during the Spanish Civil War. And I go, wow, hearing the experiences he had, it gave a very distinct perspective on politics, on the church, and how we can grow past all of that if we need to. Be praised, my Lord, through brothers, wind and air, fair and stormy, all weathers, moods, by which you cherish all you have made. I took this picture. I was in Antarctica. It was a snowstorm. It was the 1996 season for collecting meteorites in the East Antarctic Plateau. There were six of us. We were living in these little tents. You can see my tent there in the center of the picture. I lived in that tent for six weeks. Be praised, my Lord, through Sister Water. She is very useful and humble and precious and pure. The Cassini mission to Saturn took this image. It's water coming out of the icy moon Enceladus. And as it happens, my master's thesis 45 plus years ago was all about how moons made of ice like this orbiting the outer planets were going to be molten in their interiors. I never actually thought I'd be able to see the water coming out of the molten interiors just like I predicted. Be praised, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and greets us and governs us. This is another uh, Cassini image. It was taken when the spacecraft was on the far side of planet Saturn from where the sun is. So we're looking at the nighttime side of Saturn. And the rings that you hear, see here aren't the, the icy rings that you see from Earth. Those rings are made of chunks of ice that reflect the light back to us. But instead, what we're seeing is the dust in between the chunks of ice that scatter the light out beyond it, like, like dust in a beam of light. And I talk about Earth because inside that little dot, that is planet Earth. Be praised to you, my Lord, through sister death, from whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin, Blessed are they she finds doing your will. No second death can do them harm. Interstellar clouds like this one imaged by Hubble, they're made of dust erupted out of the explosion of dying stars. And when other exploding stars send out shock waves to compress these dust clouds, new stars and planets are formed. 
praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. Notice how the perspective of St. Francis is expanded with the perspective of seeing his words connected to scenes from off the earth and how those images change the perspective when they're associated with, you know, the personal stories of somebody you know who says, I remember taking that picture or I know what that picture means to me scientifically. In his version of the Laudato Si, Pope Francis looks at the same earth that St. Francis looked at from the perspective of our times. And when you do read it, which I hope you do, it, it, you catch on really quickly that this isn't just some story about climate change. It's not even about ecology. It's about justice. But Pope Francis goes beyond what bishops and popes before him have said about justice and the need for economic justice, because he ties justice together with the ecology, the echo problems are symptoms of economic and social justice problems, but ultimately they're evidence of personal sin. Because the fundamental truth underlying all of it is that we, you and I are all creatures of this universe, this universe that we've just taken pictures of and seen. We are all equally subject to the laws of this universe, which are God's laws. What does it mean to see yourself as a creature of the universe? It means that we have a certain sense of who we are and how we relate to everything else in the universe. And as usual, Chesterton said it best, this is a paraphrase of what he, he wrote in Orthodoxy. He says, the essence of all pantheism is that nature is our mother, but the main point of Christianity is this. Nature is not our mother. Nature is our sister. Nature was a solemn mother to the worshipers of Isis, to Cybele, to, to Wordsworth, or to Emerson. But to St. Francis, nature is a sister and even a younger sister, a little dancing sister, someone to be laughed at as well as loved. Which means you don't dominate your little sister but you don't worship her either. We are both children of the same father. Incidentally, notice something about Chesterton here. Uh, as we saw earlier, St. Francis actually does refer to earth as our mother, but not as a mother goddess, the way that the pagans would put it, which is to say, this is typical Chesterton. He's a little sloppy in the details, but spot on when it comes to actually the essentials of what he was trying to say. So, so what does this mean for us? It means that our problems of the ecology are not technical problems with technical solutions. They're human problems. They're problems of good and evil. There's no simple fix to them. We're never going to come to the point where you don't have to worry about taking care of the earth. We'll never come to the point where we think we won't have to worry about making mistakes. T.S. Eliot wrote about this in, in his choruses from the play The Rock back in the 1930s when there were all these isms out there that were competing with how they were going to fix the world. He wrote of, of, of humanity in, in the modern world. They constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. But the man that is shall shadow the man that pretends to be. There is no system that will substitute for us being good. We're never going to get it right all the time, but that's no excuse to not keep trying. Rather, it's a reason to stop beating up on ourselves or our neighbor for not being perfect. My point is that all of these principles are found throughout Laudato Si, and you find them in the principle and foundation of the spiritual exercises of St. Saint, Saint Ignatius. We're created to praise, reverence, and serve God. The things of this world have been created to help us accomplish that. So we're only to use the things that lead us to that goal, be indifferent to the things that lead us away, not to desire health or riches or honor or longevity, but only desire that which helps us become what God created us to be. And if that's too many words, just, just 
boil it down to some Jesuit sayings. Find God in all things. Do everything. Ad maiorum dei gloriam for the greater glory of God. Be men and women for others. It's incarnational spirituality. It's finding God in the physical universe. That's why we study and teach about the physical universe in all of its forms, in all of its manifestations, because God so loved this physical universe and the people within it who are a part of the physical universe. So much did God love it that he sent his only son to become a part of this physical universe. And we're called to look down on this creation with the same perspective as the Trinity, looking down on all the plane of the world. In other words, God is calling us to be scientists. How does that fit into education? How does it affect how we educate and what we educate? Well, one way to look into this is to look into the education of a great scientist. And I'm not talking about ethics. Ethics goes without saying. You have to be an ethical person to be a good person. And I'm not talking about being a good Catholic. That goes without saying. You know, obviously, if you're going to be a Catholic, you want to be a good Catholic. Surprisingly, what I'm talking really is about the skills you need to be a good scientist. I mean, look at Galileo, who was a great scientist. See how the education he got was able to shape him to accomplish the things he accomplished. And, you know, before you think I'm praising some heretic here, Galileo was never condemned of heresy. He was condemned of suspicion of heresy. Well, that's a long story. And in fact, he was a good scientist and a committed Catholic. His two daughters were both nuns. Of course, he actually never married their mother, but, you know, he's an Italian of his era. But, you know, if that's not enough, remember, he accepted the results of his trial at the hands of the church, even though the trial was unfair and he knew it. He could have fled Italy. He could have gone up to the Protestant North. He stayed in Florence. Of course, he was a complicated guy. He was full of faults. He was subject to original sin like the rest of us. But I think in his person, you can find some echoes of how a good education turns you into a good scientist. I'm going to rely here on a recent biography, which I really like by J.L. Hebron. It's a little quirky at times, but it's the biography that I think that does the best of describing Galileo's early life. He was born in Pisa in 1564, educated at home until he was 11. The family moved to Florence at 1575. He attended a monastery school in Vallombrosa, which is you know, just outside of town, east of town. And it could even be that for a short time, he was a, a, a novice there at the monastery. The school was famous for teaching arts, astrology, mathematics, rhetoric, and cosmology. And I'm saying, yes, astrology, because astrology was part of the sciences in those days. 1578, the family moves back to Pisa. Galileo tries to get into the Collegio de Sapienza. There were scholarships for the poor, but he was only 14 years old. Normally, he had to be 18 to go to school, so he didn't get in. But it shows you that already they thought he was pretty smart. And in fact, two years later, at the age of 16, he finally got into the University of Pisa. His dad wanted him to study medicine because he could make a living at it. And that meant studying Aristotelian physics in those days and astrology. You wanted to know what influence of the planets were causing the disease, which is why we call diseases influenza, which is the Italian word for influence. And while he was there, he hears a talk from Estirio Ricci, who was visiting Pisa with the court of the Medicis, who was giving a, a lecture on Euclid. Galileo was fascinated by the mathematics. He got Ricci to convince his dad to change his major to mathematics, but you know, a few years later, he leaves the university without a degree. But while he's there, he gets his education from these various experts in Aristotelian physics, some of whom said, oh, we're in love with Aristotle and Thomas got it all wrong trying to make it, to fit it into Christianity. Uh, Benedetti is a course mathematician he says, oh, you should reject Aristotle because there are new ideas of how things move and, and Galileo would adopt those ideas. 
a Dante scholar who ended, you know, edited the index of forbidden books, wrote a book about motion and the errors in Aristotle. And Galileo eventually publishes a lot of these ideas as his own. But notice and all of the different people who reject um, the ideas of the past, Galileo will become famous for rejecting authority. How did Galileo learn to reject authority? On the authority of the teachers who taught him to reject authority. Uh, yeah, right. He also used books and got to be very great friends with Christopher Clavius, who was a Jesuit in Rome and eventually looked through his telescope and told the world, yeah, what Galileo is seeing is there. And Clavius fought for the respect for mathematicians. But he did more than just read math. Like a lot of nerds, he was into fantasy and science fiction. They didn't call it science fiction back then. Maybe it was philosophy fiction, you know, fi-fi. One of his favorite books was Orlando Furioso, literally Furious Roland. And it was this bawdy tale of you know, chivalry at the time of Shem, Charlemagne. And as Hilbrun quotes in this book, you can see a future where Galileo himself is going to attack the philosophers, the theologians, the mathematicians, taunt the Jesuits, joust with everybody who contests his priority or his opinions, becoming a knight errant, quixotic, fearless. He's basically treating the characters in Orlando Furioso as his role model. He was big into poetry, but not just for entertainment's sake, but as a way of teaching philosophy and later cosmology. While he's in Pisa, he begins hanging out with a, with a group called the Academia degli Altia Alterati, <clears throat> the Academy of the Alterati. What does Alterati mean? It's one of those crazy Italian words that, you know, you hear it and you see, oh, the alterated, that, that, that's the English uh, cognate, but no. It actually means more like spoiled or ruined. It's the word you use for food that's gone bad. So you can see a kind of a twist that they're calling themselves. We're the, the guys who have gone bad compared to what everybody else is because we're you know not going to follow the rules. It's also the word that you use for people who are under the influence of alcohol. They've been altered by alcohol. So basically they were saying that we are the academy of the ones who are drunk on knowledge. And so they had these great debates, you know, over good meals on, you know, who's a better poet or Ariosto or Tasso, Homer or Virgil? Is Dante really a great poet? Is Tuscan Italian the best Italian? You can imagine the kinds of conversations they were having. Uh, Hilbrun quotes, one of his modern admirers who had ranked him as the best master of Italian prose after Machiavelli remarks that Galileo's sonnets, Galileo wrote sonnets, uh, we're lucky that there aren't more of them. But it's true that selections of Galileo's writings are used even today to teach Italian children how to write and how to think with lots of excerpts of his literary criticism. Like his science, they illustrate how to com combat pedantry and error, reject authority, and build on reason and experience. When Galileo in December 1609 points his best telescope at the moon, he's able to draw pictures of what he's seen because he has been trained in art. He has been trained in perspective. Turns out he was not the first person to look through the moon with a telescope, to look through a telescope at the moon. There's a fellow in England, Thomas Harriet, who did that. But notice the beautiful watercolors that Galileo paints on the left and the sketch that Harriet gives you on the right. Galileo's training in perspective not only means that he can convey this, but that he has the eye to see perspective, to know that he's looking at a ball being illuminated in various aspects by sunlight. Why is it that we honor Galileo and not Thomas Harriet or some of the other teachers who anticipated Galileo's ideas? You know, Galileo perfects these ideas. 
Galileo can teach other people about these ideas. He was a better artist. He was a better writer. He had a broader sense of thinking, a broader perspective than the ones who came before him. All of the ideas that are in his books are ideas that were already there, but he was the one who could put them together into a system and present that system in a way that taught the world. So many of Galileo's discoveries were already made by Harriet. You know, Hilbrun says, as a mathematician, both pure and applied, Harriet was Galileo's superior. The transformation of that Dutch gadget called the telescope into an instrument powerful enough to detect novelties in the heavens, that didn't require Galileo. His unique strength, Galileo's unique strength, was interpreting what he saw. What can we learn from Galileo's education? First of all, it was a universal education and it was a unified education. It was science and literature and art all together. And that's important even today, especially today. Because let me tell you, as a scientist, this is what a scientific meeting looks like. A bunch of people looking at posters or hearing five minute or seven minute talks. When you go to a scientific meeting, you either have to give a short talk or you're gonna be producing these posters. So a young scientist has to be taught how to write and write quickly and write well. You spend most of your day writing papers, writing proposals, writing press releases. You spend your day drawing figures. The better the figure, the more likely it is that people can understand your work. And if people understand your work, then you'll cite your work. And then maybe you'll get you know, some more money to do some more work. You need to know how to write. You need to know how to speak in public, you need to know how to think on your feet and talk on your feet or think and talk on your feet in front of a poster. You know, where did I learn to make posters? I learned it in high school, working on the high school yearbook. Where do you learn to write? Where do you learn to draw figures? Where do you learn to speak on your feet? Where do you learn to make good posters with, you know, good layout and white space and a flow of information? Let me tell you, they don't teach you that at MIT. I know, I went there, I taught there. You learn that in high school. You learn that on the yearbook staff, doing debate, forensics, model UN. I learned to analyze data in my high school English literature class where they taught me how to analyze poetry where I learned how to analyze the grammar of a foreign language. And what should such an education get you? How can we actually do better than Galileo and avoid Galileo's mistakes? One thing I think a Catholic-based education should do and can do is to instill in a student a confidence based on humility. What do I mean by that? Confidence based on humility. Look, everybody's got imposter syndrome, but if you've gone through a good Catholic education, you should be able to have a new kind of imposter syndrome. Not that, oh my gosh, they're gonna find out that I really don't know what I'm talking about. But maybe just the sheer joy of holding your own when you know you're swimming in deep waters and we're all faking it. You love every test because it's a chance to strut your stuff and you know, pull the wool over the eyes of those who think they're better than you because you know they went to Harvard or Phillips Exeter. The product of a Catholic education should have a Copernican kind of elitism. It's not that I'm better than everyone else, but rather I'm a planet alongside all the other planets. We're all faking it together and learning together and having fun together. But it goes beyond that. It goes to the very heart of why we even do this stuff. Why are we doing science? Why do we write poetry? Why do we run a successful organization? You know, are we doing it to, to make money, to gain power, to impress girls? Trust me, none of that happens when you're a scientist. Why do we do anything for the ad maiorum mei gloria, for the greater glory of me? Is it for veritas or for vanitas? 
what's the purpose and the use of the confidence that you get from being well-educated? At the end of the day, it had better be for the greater glory of God, or else it all turns to ashes in your mouth. Our schools are where you grow out of that teenage condition of self-consciousness to being self-aware. Our schools are where we learn to accept God's love, love that's never in doubt, but should never be taken for granted. What does being self-aware look like? It means being aware both of something, what something seems to be, but also what it is. It means you can see here a cool image of a unicorn, but you can also see beyond that and recognize that this isn't one of those clouds of gas and dust. It's a star forming region. It means having more than one perspective. That's why we study more than one subject. That's why we study more than one language, more than one culture, more than one history. That ability to see from more than one viewpoint arises from striving to be a person for others, while at the same time, it's what makes it possible to be a person for others. Because there's one more thing that I want to make, one last point about seeing God and creation from this perspective. What does this perspective do to our understanding of the relationship between us and creation? us and the creator. You know, there are about 10 billion stars in our galaxy and about 10 billion galaxies visible to us in the universe. And that's just in the part we can see. In a universe so big, how can the Trinity actually be out there paying attention to our tiny earth, much less me, much less now? Funny thing is, that's not a new question. In Psalm 8, we read, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, yet you've made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. And that's the clue to what I think Chesterton is saying here. The earth is so very small in the cosmos, but the earth is so very large and the cosmos is so very small. The cosmos is about the smallest hole that a man can hide his head in. When we live our lives day to day, we're here on earth and the earth imposes its reality on us, whether we want it to or not. But what we create for ourselves is a cosmology for how we think the universe works, which is no bigger than our own feeble imagination. And therefore it's small because we're afraid to make it big enough to encompass everything that God has in store for us. But think about those pictures I showed at the beginning of Laudato Si. I remind you, today, even the planets are places that are part of this earth in that the part that we human beings live and breathe and touch and can go to, and now are a reality that we have to deal with, even if we don't totally understand them. We create scientific cosmologies not to hide our head in them, heads in them, but to give us a way to understand and appreciate the earth, the bigger world that we live in. Without education, without that cosmology, the earth itself would be so very large that we'd be lost in it. A truly Catholic education, Catholic in the sense of universal, embraces the arts and the sciences, prepares us for a perspective that lets you enjoy the cosmos without being fooled into thinking you already totally understand everything you see. But that imagination and that reason that we have to create this cosmology is up to the task of what we're doing if we're brave enough to accept that God has given us a trust to accept his universe, to accept his reason, to accept the love that makes us little less than angels. Thank you very much. Thank 
you, brother. I really appreciate all that you um, presented to us. I I did uh, Laudate C as um, being about justice. I think that's really, really true and, and something that hasn't been stated so plainly to me before, but I, I really appreciated that. And um, you tie into Father, um, the, the, this morning, um, Father Mike talked about um, accepting God's love, that he knows us and he loves us, um, knows us with all of our faults, our warts, and, and he loves us. And, and so, so that's, you tied right into that with the same message. So it's wonderful when things work out that way for us. So thank you well, for that. Maybe we're both stealing from the same sources. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I would guess that you are. I, I would guess that you are. So um, I also meant to let you um, know that people had asked about the PowerPoint and this and all presentations are being recorded and they are available to you until the end of June. So you will have the PowerPoint via the, the presentation. So um, if you ask that question, that is the answer to that. Um, Father, will you talk about um, learning? Brother, brother, right? please. Very important I'm sorry, that I'm brother. a brother. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, brother, you talk about um, learning to write and to speak and to think and the integration of the art in that. Could you tell about your own personal experience? You told a little bit that what you learned in high school, but I have a feeling it goes back maybe even further. I mean, we have a lot of elementary teachers on, on um, this chat and involved in um, listening to you today. And I think that their work is really important in developing those skills too. Oh my goodness. We spend all of our adult lives living out the dreams that we had when we were nine and 10 years old. And so it's so important to encourage kids to have dreams and to not forget them. Um, I went to Our Lady Queen of Martyrs parochial school in uh, outside of Detroit. I had some phenomenal teachers who I can remember their names to this day. And actually, I was not, you know, you know, a lot of really good kids who came out of that school and, and a lot of notable people. Um, I don't know if anybody here is from St. Louis. Have you ever heard of a sports reporter, Zip Rizepa? He was a classmate of mine at Queen of Martyrs. One of the things they taught me how to do was to write. I had a teacher, Adavia herself, just straight out of college. And she said, you want to write a paper that's more than just a couple of sentences, this is sixth grade. You take a bunch of lined paper, you rip it in half, you write, you know, one or two sentences on each paper, and then you can shuffle it. Now, gosh, and then, you know, when you've got, you, this is cut and paste, literally cut and paste in 1964, before there were computers. Um, I had a high school, a, a grade school principal who said, this is a kid who's pretty good at math and gave me an advanced math class a do-it-yourself, teach-yourself algebra class. And I was in the seventh grade. But this was also a place where I learned to read, where I learned to speak. When I was in the first grade, um, I guess it was fourth, fourth grade. It was the fourth grade. We were doing a project on what is heat. And what we didn't know was that this was, of course, the 60s, and all little kids were supposed to be... Uh, you know, yeah, scientists, especially little boys are going to be scientists, they're going to win the space race. Not nearly enough girls in those days. But they had us prepare a section on the nature of heat and present this to a group of grade school teachers as, you know, this is what our Lady Queen of Martyrs was doing at the Jesuit high school. And that was the first time I heard there was a place called U of D High. And I said, oh, I've got to go there. When I went to U of D High, I was told you can do the science track, but you know, the best kids, I wanted to be the best kid. They do classics. They do Latin and Greek. So I did classics. I did Latin and Greek in high school. And I was on the high school yearbook and I was the editor of the high school newspaper. I was a writer before I was a scientist. And there was this, you know, class that they made us take, which was sort of a waste of time because it was not going to be on the SAT. It's called speech. And my gosh, the things that Father Pilate taught me in speech are what I'm making my life on, my living on for the rest of my life, including things like, God, you're an Italian, use your hands, because I was, you know, you know, <laughs> stiff as anything the first time I tried to give a talk. I love that. I love that story. That, that's great. Um, we have a question from our audience. Um, Mary asks, do you have to, would you be able to comment on the need to have students write their own reflections on scripture? Oh my goodness. Um, 
why do we write scientific papers? When we present them, when everybody kind of knows the results before they're written down, it's because writing it down crystallizes it. Writing it down changes this vague idea. Yeah, I kind of think I know what's going on. As soon as you try to put it into words, you realize, mm, I didn't really understand. And so, of course, you're going to reflect on scripture, but writing it down is the key part of it. Writing it down is where you make it your own. And again, I don't care what job, what life, where are you are going, what you're doing, being able to write coherently is being able to think coherently and to know what poetry can teach you so that you know that life is more than just the owner's manual. Life is the poetry that makes you want to drive the car. And I think you have just given the biggest shout out possible to all the fine arts teachers in our audience and in our schools, because um, the use of the drawings and art and the perspective that you talked about with Galileo, that, that's great thinking and it's it's such a solid argument for how the arts need to be integrated into everything that we're doing. And, and it works both ways. Um, one of the great jobs I had just before I entered the Jesuits was I taught at a wonderful little school in, in Pennsylvania called Lafayette College. And I was actually the housemaster for 20 intellectually curious students, some of them very curious, but they were really bright kids. And so I would go to their thesis defenses, you know, they do senior theses. And it was fascinating. I was teaching in the physics department, but I had students in the house who were, you know, in art majors. The physics students would talk about the elegance and beauty of this particular theory and that particular set of equations. And the art students would talk about, well, here's the piece of art I've done, and this balances that, and this has a force here which thrusts. And you suddenly realize the art students can only explain what they're doing using the analogy, the language, the simile of scientific terminology, and the scientists can only express why they're doing it by using the language, the, the, the symbolism, the, the poetry of the arts. Because at the end of the day, science, a scientific explanation is a piece of poetry. A falling object is not that equation. That equation is a piece of poetry that says, the path of a falling object is like, well, like that simile, isn't it? Yeah. I love it. That, that's great. The other um, comment that you had was, was um, that really stuck with me is that the problem is not necessarily the technology. The problem is with man. And mm -hmm. um, I think that that is something that I've thought about a, a lot. And um, again, right. you articulated it more clearly than me. And I appreciate that very much. Well, one of the things that we have to remember and we have to teach is we're going to get it wrong. And there's no one answer. They're just, just because ecology is a problem doesn't mean that my solution is the only solution that's right. And if you don't believe in my solution, therefore uh, you shouldn't, you know, you, you don't really have, no. Because one of the things you learn in science is you make progress by making mistakes and then admitting, okay, this is what I did wrong. This is why it doesn't work. Now I know something I didn't know before. Yeah, definitely. So um, we have another question from another um, participant today. Um, my son is interested in natural physics. He enjoys listening and reading the work of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Do I need to be concerned that he is not a believer? Um, no, because you should point out that Neil Tyson, who's actually a friend of mine, uh, he went to high school with my best friend. Neil Tyson's a really bright guy and he gets it wrong because we all get it wrong. And growing up is the ability to say, I like what this person does, even though I think they get it wrong. That uh, I love that music, even though the musician you know, lived a miserable lifestyle, doesn't mean that they didn't make good music. That doesn't mean that they were evil people or good people, we're Catholics. We're not the society of saints, we're the society of sinners. That's and we have to accept that uh, we can love what someone does and yet criticize. We don't have to be perfect. You know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. 
I, I believe in that. We have one more question, then we'll let you go, brother. Um, you have a beautiful gift for wonder and awe. This is from Kathleen of God's creation. It seems to me that your excitement is contagious. Do you think that that's a necessary component to help our kids to really learn? Of course. You're only going to learn something when you want to learn it. Um, one of the things they started doing at MIT 50 years ago when I was there, which is now used everywhere, is to get students involved in research. And the point is not that, you know, you're going to make a groundbreaking or you know, earth shattering results, though that does happen sometimes. But it's only when you start working on a problem that you suddenly realize, oh, this is why I need to know that thing that they were teaching me in that class. Now I see how it works. And now I'm motivated. And I, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to do the research? Ultimately, because it's fun. The physical universe is good. That's in Genesis. God made it to be good. God reveals himself in the goodness of the universe. God wants us to be happy. And the things that they tell you don't do, it's because they don't make you happy in the long run. And, you know, growing up is where you realize that the church isn't saying, don't do that. The church is saying, don't do that. <laughs> and so that's very well played. You had a little drama in your background too, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. It's one of the things. But the point is that it's by getting enthusiastic that makes you want to learn the stuff. And then when you want to learn it, no teacher is going to get in your way. Passion. Ultimately, ultimately, we teach ourselves. But we teach ourselves when we see the example of somebody else who is having a blast doing what they're doing. I believe that. I think that's absolutely true. And I want to thank you, brother, for being with us today. Your talk was inspiring, and it really does unite and ignite lots of thoughts in many of us. So thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, for all of your our participants out there, if you would please complete complete the post um, session evaluation, we would be grateful. Um, it should be appearing on your screen, and if you could complete that, we would be grateful. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you all who have joined us today, and um. Enjoy your next sessions at NCA 2021. Thanks for having you all here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.